Good morning. Our, the sermon today will be in Romans 8, verses 26 through 30. If you would like to follow along in the Pew Bible in front of you, it is on page 944. If you could please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what you pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And for those who we foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is God's holy word. Please be seated. Nicely done. Nice. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who lived the life that we should have lived on our behalf, and he died the death that we deserve to die, but he died that on our behalf as well. His, pay, his death paid for the penalty as lawbreakers on our behalf. And as we live our lives in this world, you will bring situations our way that we may not understand and will bring hardship and suffering. May we hear your word this morning, knowing that Jesus has us in his hand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Romans 8, 26 to 30, as we continue to look at why and how we can find our security in the Holy Spirit of God. And when we look at the condition of the world, we definitely need to hear this more and more. Um, I think for about the past month, there has been some talk about what's going on with the coronavirus. And though it hasn't really reached us in mass here, there are parts of the country, that, or parts of the world rather, that are struggling and struggling very, very deeply. I came across um, a prayer request that was sent out from the Hubei province in China, and it was a pastor in a, in a city named Wuhan. And it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to share what he has to say in the midst of this because they are pretty much on lockdown in that province because of what's going on with this. And it's, and it's spreading a bit to the rest of the world, but... I was really struck by what he had to say and the prayer request that he had for us to, to give to us. And he says this, Peace be upon you. At this time, the virus has been at the center of our thoughts and lives. We are always watching the latest news and thinking about how our family and the church should face this. As for my family, I have gathered masks and food and have ventured outside as little as possible. When venturing out in public, I have worn a mask, but as for the rest, I place my life in the Lord's hands. As for the church, we are all part of a great struggle. We are facing a severe test of our faith, and we feel that Christians in our city are not only called to suffer with the people, but we have been called to pray for those who are fearful and to introduce them to the peace of Christ. Please pray for the peace of Christ to rule and reign in our hearts so that we may be a witness to those who are without hope. Pray that through this hardship, God's children will grow nearer to the Almighty and that the Lord will use it to purify our souls and to give us many opportunities to proclaim the gospel. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to be strong in Christ's love. Even a sparrow cannot fall to the ground apart from the will of our Father. With so many millions facing this pestilence, can it be outside God's will? And all that we are experiencing, is it any worse than what Abraham faced in Sodom and Jonah faced in Nineveh? If God withheld judgment on Sodom because of one righteous man or because of 120,000 who didn't know their left hand from their right withheld destruction from Nineveh, what of the city of Wuhan where we live? We are part of many thousands of righteous believers who live in this city made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. Please pray for God's mercy upon Wuhan and ask him to bring peace upon our city, province, and all of China at this time. Please intercede, asking our wonderful Savior to bring peace and healing to those who are inflicted with illness, to provide supernatural strength and protection for the medical personnel struggling on the front lines, and to bless every official at every level, 
who are working to help the people of Wuhan. Please do not be concerned with my welfare or be agitated or fearful, but pray in the name of Jesus. Many people are courageously serving our city, especially the medical personnel who are risking their lives. If they can take on such worldly responsibilities, how can the body of Christ not be more readily to take on spiritual responsibilities? Please ask the Lord to use this pestilence for his glory so that when it is over, there will be many more souls born again into the kingdom of God than have perished. This is a man who understands that it is not based upon the circumstances that we face, but upon the Savior who's on the throne, that he moves and lives and is able to have his being. And when we think about what's going on in the church in Rome, where Paul is writing this, there are a lot of uh, theological discussions, I'm sure, that can come about from Romans 8. But that wasn't the point of Romans 8. Romans 8 was, the there, was there where in the midst of the, of the insecurity that is going on regarding the culture that was going on, regarding the persecution that was being inflicted upon the Roman church, that Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, is giving them a hope. He's giving them a lifeline. He's giving them an anchor that is found in the Holy Spirit of God. There's a lot of things that are mentioned in this passage of Scripture, but I want you to know at least three things because that's just what we do, I guess, with the, the three things. But in verses 26 and 27 of Romans 8, there's some things that we're going to find out that we don't know, but those things will help us. That's number one. What we don't know will help us. In verse 26, in verses 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Well, what weakness are we talking about? Well, if you had a chance to read the previous passage, you're seeing that there is a lot of suffering that is going on. And in verse 18 of the, of the previous paragraph, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we are moving forward in our suffering with the hope of what's to come. If this is all there is, then there, and, there, then the, and this is all the hope that there is, well, it's no wonder that there's so many that don't have any hope. But we have a hope that is beyond this life, and it, and it says in verse 25 that if we hope for what we do not see, which none of us have seen it, but if we hope for that which we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And so that's where the likewise comes in, is that the Spirit is helping us in our weakness. That's where the patience comes from. The patience is coming from the fact that the Spirit is there with us all the time to be able to help us in the direction that we need to go. But then it says this, in the midst of our weakness, we begin to pray. Now, some of you will only pray when you know what to pray. And some of you will only pray when you know the outcome of the prayer is in your favor. We do that. We, we pray, we ask God, will you please change this girl's heart so she'll want to marry me? Oh God, she broke up with me. Well, you must not be God. No, what is happening is, is that God is working something in us to where we're not looking at our circumstances or simply the blessings. He's giving us an insight into, the, into finding security in the one who blesses, Christ. For, if we, we, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We are ignorant at times, knowing what to do, knowing what to pray for. But that doesn't stop us from praying. But it says here that the Spirit is also praying on our behalf. The Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There's just going to be times when you're not going to be able to articulate it. Pray anyway. There's times when you're not going to know what the end result is going to be. Pray anyway. You may think that when you pray that uh, God is only God when He answers you, but, it, and, but yet it seems like He's silent. Pray anyway. Because we know that he's working. Because in verse 27 it says, He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Recently, um, I was watching an old interview that Dick Cavett did. It was back in 1970. This is the wonders of YouTube. We can go back and watch these old interviews. And one of the interviews he was doing was with one of my favorite, favorite, favorite songwriters of all time. It's a guy named Paul Simon. Many of you know who he is. And Paul Simon, back in 1970, 1971, uh, wrote a song. It was on the, on the last album when Simon and Garfunkel were together. He was writing a song called Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And he was talking about how, and that's just why I like these old interviews, is because 
he was talking about how this song came to be. And so Paul Simon, when he's sitting in the studio being interviewed by Dick Cavett, he pulls out his guitar and he starts playing this first part until he gets, he said there was a point where he just got stuck. And Dick Cavett asked a question that on the surface sounds kind of dumb. Well, how do you know when you're stuck? Well, you know you're stuck when you're stuck is, would, would have been my answer. But Paul Simon, he said, well, and I thought this was one of the most insightful things that I'd ever heard. He said, well, everywhere I would try to go would take me to a place I didn't want to be. Everywhere I wanted to go or everywhere I would try to go would take me to a place I didn't want to be. What would happen, this just ran across my mind, and I, I, I want to ask myself this at some point this afternoon when I have a chance to think about it. What would happen if God answered every one of your prayers the way you wanted them to be answered? How would your life be? Would it be, would it be fantastic or would it be an unmitigated dumpster fire? Who knows? But sometimes God doesn't give us what, he, what we want. Sometimes he tells us to wait. Sometimes he, he says yes. And I used to say this frequently, and I haven't said this in a while, but I'll, I'll repeat it. If God answers your prayers the way you want, what do you do? Well, you praise his name. But what if God says no to your prayer? Or you're wanting God to say no to something, and he says, no, yes, God, please don't send me over here. I don't want to go over here. No, I want you to go over here. Will you be upset and throw a temper tantrum because he doesn't answer your prayers the way you want them to be answered? Or do you say praise his name? Or if he says, wait, do you say praise his name? Because what's the ultimate end goal behind the Spirit working in you, interceding for you when you are in a position and lack the capacity to know how to pray? Verse 27, it says, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of who? That's exactly right. God. God's will. Not your will. It is God's will. See, Jesus knows exactly what we're dealing with. He, there were times when Jesus wept, and he knew what the end result was going to be, and he knew that when he, he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he wept because he saw the groaning and the, the suffering that was going on in this world, and it's just, that was not how the world was intended to be. And yet here we are. And when we begin to look at what is happening here, and every time that Jesus, there were times when Jesus began to do a miracle, and this says, like one time in Mark 7, that he sighed. Well, why was he sighing? We, 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 we rush so hard to the miracle that we don't see what Jesus was going through at the time. He sighed. Why was he sighing? Oh, I wish the world wasn't like this. But I'm going to do something about it. And only I can do something about it. And I'm, I can't wait. Well, what, our weaknesses come about because our members are in the flesh and they want to take us away from the things of God. Our culture, or what the New Testament calls the world, is, is rushing away from God's design over and over. We're going through personal suffering. But actually, one of the reasons why we are so weak is the fact is that we're not God. Satan made that promise, if you eat of this... You'll be like God knowing good from evil. Well, that was an empty promise. We know good from evil, but it doesn't mean that we are like God. It took us actually further away from him. But our prayer life rises and falls based upon our understanding of who's in control. See, if you think you're in control of your life and you think you've got it all together, your prayer life is going to be less. But if you come to a point where God sends suffering, and I believe he sends it, some people say, well, I, I think he just allows it. No, I think there are times he sent it to the cross. He sent it to Job. He sends these things our way because it'll develop a holy resilience that we have when the hard times end up coming and our resilience and our reliance is based upon Christ and not our circumstances and not our abilities. Do you see? So when we come to a point where we're at the bottom of the barrel... We're the stuff that scraped off the bottom of the barrel. It is there that we realize that we have nothing. And Christ is everything. And our prayer life increases. And God will keep hammering away at our lives to show that our resilience and our reliance must be on Him. Amen? It must be on Him. That's where we have to be. The second part of this, though, as you can see, it slides right into it in verse 28. And many of us know this passage. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. 
This is a passage of Scripture that sadly is excised from not only, not only is it excised from verses 26 to 30, but there's also a passage that's excised from verse 28. But here's the thing we need to know. What we do know, number two, what we do know will work for us. What do we know? See, what is he saying? And we know. Verse 26 says, for we don't know what to pray. But verse 28 says, and we know. That for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We come across this and we, we realize that this is pulled out. In fact, sadly, there's people that pull just a piece of this from verse 28 that says that God's going to work everything out. Or sometimes they don't even say God. All, everything's going to work out fine. But they take God out of that and then they take that verse out of the rest of it. All things work together for good. In your weaknesses, God is working something even in the midst of your weaknesses, even in the midst of your groaning, even in the midst of your suffering. He's working all things for good, but to whom? Everybody? Actually, this is one that is only for a certain group of people. And we know that for those who love God, how can you best love God? By surrendering to His Son. Not just doing a bunch of good things and hoping God will weigh the good and the bad out and hopefully there'll be more good than bad. No, we are by nature sinners. In fact, the Bible tells us all have sinned. Earlier in this passage, earlier in this book, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We see what is happening here. We see our condition. There's nothing that we can do that's good outside of Christ that the good will outweigh the sin. But there is someone that is working in us. And if we love God, we love God best by loving His Son most. We love God best by treasuring His Son most. And so if we surrender to all that Christ is, and we surrender to all that Christ has done, that's how we know we've loved God. So this is a passage and a promise for Christians. If you're not a Christian this morning, this does not apply to you, but it can. If you'll surrender to Christ, even right now, if you'll surrender to Christ, this promise can and will apply to you. And he says that if we know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good, all things, for those who are called according to his purpose. Calling, that's such an interesting thing. Next month, I will have, I will have made my calling to ministry public. In fact, it was March 1st, 1992. In church world, there used to be a thing where you weren't quite ordained, but you were licensed to the ministry. And I still have that little certificate, March 1st, 1992. I was licensed into the ministry. That Three weeks later, I preached the worst sermon that was ever preached in the history of anything. It was terrible. I worked for three weeks on that thing, and it took 10 minutes to preach. It was, it, it was just zip. It was, it was fantastic. I still have the tape. Don't ask me if you get to listen to it not going to happen. But I was talking but everybody kept talking to me about oh it's wonderful that you've been called, you've been called, you've been called. As if they hadn't. See, people think that the only calling that happens is to those who go into professional ministry, whether it's preaching or pastoring or in the mission field, they think that's the only calling. But the Bible does not say that. The Bible tells us, in fact, we're going to see it in verse 30, that all of us have been called into, into the kingdom of God. He calls us. He brings us. He chooses us. He, call, he brings us into his, his kingdom. And we are now all called into his service. And, and sadly, that's what ends up happening. Because it used to be, well, John Piper wrote a book called Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. Because everybody would think that ministry, it got to be where ministry was just only for the professionals to do. The ones who got paid to do it, the ones who were basically paid by a church to do it. But no, we're equippers to help the rest of you pursue your calling in Christ. All of you have been called into, into Christian work, into Christian service. You may, it may not be a full-time thing like I do, but he's called every one of us. Are you getting the picture? He's called every one of us because we've missed that along the way. 
and we most certainly can't. 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us. Now, who's the us? Christians. Not just the, the ministers, not just the paid staff. Christians. He saved us and he called us to a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose of grace, which he gave in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Before the world began, God called you into his ministry. He called you into his service. He called you to be part of his family. Many are called, few are chosen, Matthew 22 14 says and in romans eleven twenty nine, 29 the gifts and the calling of god are irrevocable they can't be switched they can't be changed once god has placed that his his word and his work in you once you have come to christ that calling is irreversible and irrevocable so what does that mean what does that mean for the rest of this when we start getting into this that, that starts to, when, when, if we've been in church world any amount of time or if we've gone to seminary this is a place where late night conversations would take place because of certain terms that are brought in here but this may be very new to you and we'll we'll approach it as such and it says in it says in verses uh, 8 29 to 30 well point number three would be that god what god knows what god knows will hold us what god knows will hold us let me put this passage before you again. For those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So this is what's called like a, like a golden chain of our Christian life. The chain is this, forno, predestined, called justified glorified it's right there in the word it's right there how do, how do we how do we move this along well we, if we begin to take each of these apart we begin to see a little bit more about how god moves and god works but what i also want to let you know is this is connected to verse 28 verse 28 where it's talking about all things work together for good and then it's talking about for those whom he foreknew the four connects us to verse 28 the four connects us to show us exactly what God is doing and what God is working. How God works all things together. These are passages and words that we most certainly cannot ignore. When we talk about foreknowledge, we're not talking about God being, what's the word, prescient. That he's looking down the corridors of time and he knows what we're going to do and so boom. That doesn't fit with what Paul is telling us and what the rest of the word is telling us. In fact, if you go back to, uh, oh, let's say uh, Romans chapter 8, if you go back to verses 7 and 8. Now, I want you to see what our condition is when it comes to this. It says, for the mind that is set on the flesh. That means a mind that is not a follower of Jesus. The mind that is, not, that is set on the flesh, not follower of Jesus, following its own desires, following its own will, if you will. For the mind that is set on the flesh is what? hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law so that sounds like it's a it's a choice right you they they cannot submit to God's law it does not submit to God's law I've said that wrong let me for it does not submit to God's law that sounds like a choice but then it goes into saying that there's no way that it can it can't submit to God's law it can't submit to the things of God so if God's going to look down the corridors of time and find out, well, who is going to be the one that uh, is going to receive and choose the things of God? If all of us can't receive the law of God and can't receive any of that, if none of us are righteous, no, not one, no one understands, none seek after God, all have gone astray. If God's going to look down the corridors of time to find out who on their own would receive Jesus, who would he find? You wouldn't find anybody. I just... See, and here's the thing. If you grew up in a, in a um, monarchy, this would be easier to understand because of the unmitigated control that a monarchy has over every part of life. 
But we've grown up in a democracy where we're basically we the people and we're the ones that get to decide everything. We get to decide laws. We get to decide who goes to, who, who's president. We get, to deci- we get to decide everything. And so sometimes I think we put that up on God. But God is not someone that was elected to office by us. God is God whether you see him as God or not. And God here is exerting his benevolent monarchy over all of the earth. And what he's saying here is this, for those whom he foreknew. That means that they're just like in the Old Testament, God chose a people of Israel. He's doing the same thing. He is calling a people to himself. He's calling a people to himself, whom he, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Now here's the thing, we get so caught up on that word, we miss the rest of it. What is the point of God saving us? Is the point of God saving you so you can go to heaven? Well, that's a a benefit. I mean, I don't know anybody that wants to go to hell. I mean, if you do, let's talk afterwards. There's there's something going on. But I don't really know anybody, if you were given the choice, would you rather go to heaven or would you rather go to hell? I know ACDC made it sound like, the and Billy Joel, they sang some songs that made, you know, hell sound like it's going to be one big party. Well, if you read what the scriptures have to say, it's going to be the antithesis of that. You're going to be alone. You're going to be away from any hope. That's what hell is. And so when we begin to look at this, we see that the purpose of it all is this. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren many brothers he saved us so that we would become more like christ now i want you to think about how you think about your life because some of you have got a lot of rules that you're expecting everybody to abide by what would happen if do you believe that everybody should be conformed to your way of thinking do you think everybody should be conformed to your way of thinking well, I've got my thoughts on things, and these are things that I think, and I think everybody should think these thoughts that I think. Something like that, right? But we, but we all have our rules that we try to inflict. And I would say sometimes we inflict. And if people don't like our rules, and they don't go and do what we want, and it can be under any kind of, any kind of topic, any kind of issue, then what we say is we want to take our ball and go home. But the fact is, is that I'm not to be conformed to you. And you're not to be conformed to me. We're to be conformed to Christ. So are the things that you're, the rules that you have, that you're laying on people, are they helping people be more conformed to Christ? Are they helping people be more conformed to your way of thinking? When it comes to church, and it comes to our Christian walk, God has not called us from before the foundation of the earth for us to continue in our selfishness he's called us to put ourself aside and as gar read earlier what did he what did gar read i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice what does that mean it means you've got to die to you in order to be able to be alive in christ it's a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, your spiritual acts of service, that type of deal. It affects how you live. But if you just like church world because of what it can do for you, rather than I love church so I can surrender myself to make Christ most of all, to make much of Jesus, because Jesus changes everything. Jesus is enough. That's where we begin to to go into this. We have been predestined to basically show that Jesus is enough for us. In order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers, we're going to be a part of that family. And I love that. I love the family aspect of things. And then when we get into this, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Well, there's that word again. The calling is where we begin to see it here on earth. The foreknowledge and the predestining are things that have happened in the counsels of God. We don't understand it. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things are of the Lord. But the things that he's revealed, he expects us to follow. But the secret things are of the Lord. We don't know how God works. We don't know where God's working. We don't know who he's working in. Uh, But I know that he's working. And And I do know that when we begin to recognize this calling, 
Well, we can just read in Romans 4, 17, as it is written, and this was written about Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. And then Paul goes on to talk about this. It says, In the presence of God and in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Well, what are some of the things that do not exist that were called into existence? I can tell you one thing that the Bible tells us, and that's our faith. In, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it talks about for the... For, I am going to make sure I'm reading this right. You ever try to memorize a passage of Scripture and then you're like, nope, better make sure. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So you're not, you're not saved based on what you do. You're saved upon the work that God has done. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. What's the gift of God? Well, you want to talk about conversation. Is the grace the gift? Well, well yes, we didn't earn that. God gave that to us. But is he also talking about the faith being a gift? Oh, oh yeah, Absolutely. There's no way outside of God's working in our hearts that we would be able to believe. That faith is a gift. That's not something you can drum up. Remember what it says. You're either going to go by your experience, you're going to go by what the Word has to say. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So who gets credit for belief? God does. He is working. In fact, some of you, He's working in right now. You're on, you're on the cusp. You've been hearing the Word of God over and over and over again, and you're on the cusp. And you're like, what, what is going on? The things that used to mean a lot to me now don't mean anything to, to me anymore because I don't, what, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that God may be moving and working in you to change your heart and to give you the strength so that you will be able to trust and believe in Him. That's what He's called you to do. And, and if that's... If that's then what I would expect you to do and I would ask you to do and I would urge you to do is to not run away from that. Because some people think when that starts going on, I don't like feeling guilty. I, I like my old life. You lean into it. God, what are you trying to say to me? Because I sure wasn't thinking about you before, but now I am. And now I'm starting to feel like that I'm, I'm this, this, this sinner and I'm feeling this guilt for all the stuff that I've done and I wasn't feeling that before. What, what is happening? Well, God is, is issuing that call to you. But that was a call that he was working out even before the world began. He had his eye on you. And he had things set on you. And he was working in you. I mean, Revelation 17, 8 talks about that all of the names of those who were in the book of life were there from before the foundation of the world. God has his eye on you. And that's where we have to move. That's where we have to work. Even in God's eyes, Christ was slain from before the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13, 8. We are now seeing what God has been planning from before the world began, and he had you in mind. Isn't that stunning? You may feel like you're completely alone in this world, and God now is moving and working in you to show you you're not, and he's calling you. Well, there's more to this chain, isn't there? It's talking about those whom he also called. Not some of those, but all of those whom he called. He also justified. What justified is, is that means that the penalty that was against you because of your sin, he has lifted and put it on his son. Are you, you serious? Yeah, that's why the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Because Christ took our penalty. Christ took our death. And, and he gave us his righteousness. We now are in his family. We have been justified. And then one day what we're going to see is that we will soon be glorified. We will be with him in his presence one day. See, God has an end game in mind for you, dear Christian. And the suffering is there that he's ta he had been talking about where we don't know how to pray in our weakness. We, but the Spirit is coming along and interceding for us. The Spirit is praying and, and working God's will in our lives. And all of these things that the Spirit is working work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Because what He's doing is from before the foundation of the world, He is now working in you so that you will be conformed to the image of of his son. Everybody see me? Everybody up here? That we be conformed to the image of his son. See, 
none of us should be interested in being conformed to the image of anybody else when it comes to this. Are, are the rules that you lay down based upon his word, word excuse me, or are the rules that you lay down based upon your own preferences and, and, and traditions and agendas? We, we can't be interested in that. There's not enough time for that. We have to be buried in the book and find out what God has for us in the days ahead. A few takeaways before we break. So, number one, even when you're ignorant of how to pray, you're not alone in praying, so keep praying. Even if you don't know, even if you're ignorant. Well, I don't need to pray. Well, your ignorance just turned to arrogance. Congratulations to you. Ignorance is, a way for, is not a way for you to say, I'm not going to pray anymore. I don't know what to pray, so I'm not going to pray. As if you've got the corner on it. No. God knows, and he's working. As you pray, he will work his will as you pray, even if you don't know how you ought to pray in every way. Number two, our hearts begin to change toward desiring God's will over ours. As we pray, our hearts change. Our hearts change more to what God will want. And then our praise is not fueled by how God answers or the circumstances are around us, but our but our praise is fueled by the fact that God is answering and he's listening and he's not left you alone. Number three, God takes all things and works them together for good. This is a promise for Christians. This is a promise for those who treasure Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, but you want to be and and God is calling you and moving in you to, to receive him as Lord and Savior, guess what? That promise can be for you. And that will be of comfort to you, knowing that whatever happens, God's doing something in it. We know that even when Christ was dying upon the cross, that was a terrible thing that was going on, but God was doing something in it, and it was for our benefit. God is working. God is working. Say that with me. God is working. And once you recognize that, then you'll be able to endure a lot more than you believe that you can, because God is on your side. Number four. So, Paul Simon, again. He knew he was stuck when everywhere he decided to go took him to a place that he didn't want to be. And some of you right now, you may feel like you're stuck and you're trying to find all sorts of different ways to get out of your stuckdom. To try to get out of, that's a a word by the way. At least it is now. But you're trying to get out of that. You're trying to get out of the slog. You're trying to get out of that. And you're like, I don't know what to do. But be careful where you go because not everywhere you think you should go will lead you to the place that you want it to be. Many of them are empty promises, but there is one way. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through me. That's where you want to go. That's the place where you want to go. That's how you get unstuck, and it's only through Christ. So are you stuck? Are you stuck in your Christian life this morning? Are you stuck in your life outside of Christ? You don't have to be. Pray, trust in Christ, treasure Christ, and know that God had you before the world began, and he's going to have you throughout all the eternity, and he's going to have you at every point in between. You are not alone. He's conforming you to the image of his son, and you get to be a part of that family, and you get to be rescued from your sin and brokenness. This is the morning that I believe God may be calling some of you that may be calling some of you to be to have that penalty of sin removed and to know that glory awaits you and that he will be with you every step of the way now. Turn from yourself. Turn from everything else. Turn to Christ and Christ alone. He has you, I promise. Heavenly Father, guide us in all that we do and say. And Father, we may think that all of these things that are going to get us unstuck are going to take us to a place that we want to be, but they, but they don't. And who knew that Paul Simon back in that interviewer's chair, interviewee's chair back in 1971 was speaking a truth that is as true as can be. We might be stuck. We might not think that we might think in our weakness we don't know how to pray, so why bother? But we know that there is one who is for us, who is there to help us and help God's will be worked out in our lives. That everything for us as believers, everything is working out for our good because you're working it out, not us. We know from before the beginning of the world that you are calling a people to yourself. And Lord, what a joy it is to know that even though we could not follow you, we could not obey your law, 
There is one who came and did it on our behalf and that he lives in us by the Holy Spirit and we have hope and we have life and I pray that no one would walk out of this place without knowing that hope and life. Mm -hmm. Guide us, Lord. Guide us. Guide us in all that we do and say. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Help us, Lord, to know where you would have us to go and help us to trust you along the way. Even if it's through the, if it's through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not going to fear any evil because we know you're with us. Guide us, Lord. Wherever you, you take us, it's for our good and for your glory. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Is this breathe on?